Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Larry Bennett, Principal Engineer of Supplier Quality at GE Aviation, Barbara Negro, Executive Supplier Quality Leader at GE Aviation. Both of them have worked really hard on the development of the AS13100. And Rebecca Lemon is our Aerospace Industry Program Manager here at SAE. So she is an excellent resource and wealth of knowledge on the AS13100, and they're going to cover a lot of various materials on that. So I'm going to go ahead and leave the stage and let you guys take it away. Great. Thank you very much. Able to hear us okay? I'm going to assume that's a yes. Um, okay. So we, we appreciate you allowing us this platform to talk about something that I know Larry and I are both very passionate about. Um, I'll introduce myself and then let Larry introduce himself. Um, my name is Barbara Negroe. I'm the executive sourcing leader, sourcing quality leader, sourcing quality leader um, here at GE Aviation based out of our Cincinnati headquarters. Um, and I'm also the vice chair, soon to be chairman of the AESQ, so Aero Engine Supplier Quality Strategy Group. Larry? Hello, everybody. Larry Bennett, uh, privileged to be a part of the team today, and uh, I report directly to Barbara Negroy, and uh, I am uh, privileged also to be a control title holder, principal engineer in the sourcing quality realm. Uh, just, a, just a quick background, you know, I, before coming to GE 16 years ago, I was in the supplier world for about the equal amount of time, and, and at that time, you know, I, as you can relate to, uh, we had multiple customers with multiple requirements, and so at that point, you know, 16, 20 years ago, I'm wondering why can't we standardize things across the industry? And and so when I was asked in August of 18 to join this team to accomplish that, uh, you can imagine my excitement and my enthusiasm to help be a part of the solution for an ongoing issue in the industry. So we're privileged and pleased to be able to roll this out and, and talk, share it with you today. And then Becky, if you could introduce yourself as well, we'd appreciate it, you're a big part of this team. Barbara. Oh, there she is. Good to be here today. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rebecca Lemon. I am the industry program manager here at SAE International, and I've been working with the AESQ strategy group since day one, and I think that goes back to around 2013. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're ready for a great presentation today. Thanks, Barbara and Larry. Great. We want to move to the next page. Not sure who's in control there. Is it me? It is me. Okay. Um, good. So we have the um, just actually going to start out with a, a little introduction of what is the AESQ. Um, so many people on this call may not know what AESQ is, um, how it was formed, and what the purpose is. So the aero engine um, industry really had a burning platform, still does. Um, aero engine manufacturers created a collaboration working group to address this burning platform back in 2013, which Becky mentioned. Uh, and, and it was the OEMs along with key global suppliers. Um, they used the automotive example for uh, QS9000 with Ford, GM, and Chrysler as the model. Uh, so the burning platform is Airline passengers are set to double in size over the next 20 years. Um, this was true in 2013, and it's still true today. Minor setback due to, to the pandemic, but we know that uh, this is still a very real issue. The customers expect zero defects. Um, our customers, in terms of who the, the air, air framers who put our engines on, on their planes, airliners, and travelers all expect zero defects from the aerospace industry. Um, there's an increasing level of supplier made engine content. Uh, there's a global supplier footprint. We have a very global supply base as, as does everyone else these days. A uh, large number of common suppliers between the engine manufacturers. Uh, various, it's really a, a small kind of tight, tight group of suppliers there in the aerospace industry and a, a wide range of suppliers. So the range, you know, it could be a small, less than a million uh, dollar revenue business up to over two billion, and so there's different resources and, and availabilities at, at different sizes and types of suppliers. Um, and our goal of improving quality, cost, and delivery remains a key challenge. So with that, 
the, <clears throat> the AESQ was formed. Um, this manufacturing collaboration was formed to, to cover the, the burning platform I mentioned on the previous page, as well as laying out specific purposes. So the purpose of the group is to simplify and standardize the aero engine uh, requirements for suppliers um, throughout the removal of duplication and waste, create a common quality language, uh, build an existing industry standards where they exist to help make them clear and concise for, for our supply base, uh, create requirements that are simple, prescriptive, and auditable, promote the use of standardized third-party training uh, so that we all have an equal opportunity to get trained in, in the most efficient way, uh, deliver results with pace, so act quickly, act fast, um, as well as focus on effective deployment and improving the capability of the shared supply chain. There are 10 member companies for the AESQ. Um, these 10 are the voting members for any activities or, or strategies that we do. Um, it is GE Aviation, uh, Pratt and Whitney, Rolls-Royce, Safran, Honeywell Aerospace, MTU Aero Engines, GKN Aerospace, PCC Structurals, Comet Aerospace, and IHI. So you can see it's a great group of, of real high impact um, suppliers and engine OEMs that make up this and have this passion around um, you know, building capability, improving and simplifying the, the message of, of, of spec flow down to our suppliers and really not competing on quality and safety in the aerospace industry, working together to improve ourselves. Over to Larry. Okay, so when we think about the, the document that's recently been published, you know, this graphic shows you the process we followed to get to a finished state. So on the left, you'll see that we had the existing uh, engine, the manufacturer supplier requirements. You know, Rolls-Royce has their Sabre, Pratt has their uh, ASQR01, GE has their S1000, et cetera. And we also had the existing uh, AS13000 series documents, uh, regulations, uh, customer specific things that we put in draft. And, you know, that was quite a conversation when we met in August of 18 in Rolls-Royce and in, in, uh, in London, and, and there were five or six of us in the room. You know, and the, the first thing I would say is there's never in the history of aerospace that I've been involved in where there's been a spirit of openness and collaboration to share this type of information. Because when I was a supplier, there's no way GE would share S1000 with Pratt and Rolls and vice versa. So we, we, we've really come a long way as an industry that we're willing to work together for the common good for the industry. So we took that, turned it into a standard, and now you can see the standard in the top right. We've also got, uh, we still have some specific uh, OEM requirements that we couldn't rationalize. Will be the minor and 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 not a large number of them, and we've also got a a wide body of guidance material. How to execute and deploy each of the elements within the standard. Uh, just a great amount of work done by a large group of individuals to create those reference manuals that are not requirements, but they are an acceptable means of complying with the standard. Next, please. Yeah. Do this. So these are a few of the highlights of, of the significant changes within the standard. And the first thing I would say is this, regardless of what you see is changing, the change is minimal from what your existing customer requirements are. Uh, and they, they, they primarily revolve around the APQP, AS9145, uh, design and development, a little more rigor there, having a compliance assessment of the QMS, and then also the control of a, a prime supplier's sub-tier suppliers, because we see that as a real gap and, and a real opportunity to add additional rigor and, and uh, structure to. And this, this graphic is intended to show you that we follow the AS9100 model in terms of paragraph numbering and structure. And then you can see at the bottom, uh, you can see the uh, existing 9.3, which is AS9100 text, and then how we've added the ASQ 
in bold text as a supplement requirement to the AS9100 standard. And I'd use this as an opportunity to say this, why can't we commonize this within AS9100? We're working to accomplish more of that, but just understand and appreciate that, that AS9100 is an aerospace standard, and, and thus we have the airframers that have maybe different needs than the aero engine maker that we feel there needs to be more rigidity and robustness with some of these requirements for rotating critical parts. And then this is how the uh, customer specific requirements would flow out uh, for GE. Uh, as an example, uh, we're changing nothing from a flow down because we still flow down S1000 as the overarching requirement. And then we incorporate uh, AS13100 within it. And I assume that the other OEMs will do something similar, that, that the flow down will still look and feel the same. And then the incorporation is within the controlling document. And then these are a couple of highlight slides. This one here, the table on the left, has a guide to the applicability of the sections based on the organization scope, whether you're a manufacturer or a distributor or a raw material provider or a processor or a service provider. And then the graphic on the right shows the set of certification requirements depending on that organization type. Uh, section 4.3.5 of the standard uh, will require an, a compliance assessment. And we have a, a snapshot, a snippet there of, of one of the sections of the RM13009, which provides a detailed uh, plan of, of execution of how you can apply the compliance assessment uh, to meet the standard. Section 8.4. Uh, as I said, has a lot of detail regarding supplier evaluation, selection, control, and performance monitoring. And again, our reference manual 13,007 provides, provides a lot of detail and guidance material on how to execute on each of these elements. And I'm going to restate myself, but it's important to, to restate. This is one of the gaps in the aerospace industry, is the OEM uh, flow down to the primes, and then the primes flow down to their sub tiers. We constantly get, get asked by our regulators and our, our government customers, how are you getting into your sub tiers? Not just to your sub tiers, but are you getting into their sub tiers? Because each degree of separation provides an additional layer of risk and the industry is really getting intolerant of that risk. Great. and and. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, more and more content is going to sub tier. So not just primes to, to the OEMs, but sub tiers to the primes. And that's why there is a real important um, aspect to understanding the entire supply chain and the ownership and an important job that, that every single person in that supply chain has in order to keep our, our product um, safe and with the highest quality standards. So what are some of the benefits of AS 13,100 that has recently been released? Um, it's a single standard. So we had, we had published individual standards before that now are all rolled up into this AESQ uh, 13,100. It aligns with uh, AS 9100 um, and ISO. So there's less requirements for the supplier holistically if you would have pulled each of our individual um, you know, flow down requirements out separately, we added them all up. Um, and it's, it's lower cost with a single standard versus multiple. Um, it's supported by free re reference manual guides. And I'm gonna go into that a little bit on, on a couple pages from now. Um, I've gotten, I've, I've heard personally, and I know a lot of people have heard about a lot of compliments related to um, the reference manuals that they are the how. So the, the standard is the what, and, and the how is really spelled out more than we've ever done it before. Um, so it'll minimize the, the individual content that the supplier has to understand from each of the OEMs if they supply to multi multiple OEMs and there'll be a, a common process there it, as well as a common language for quality. Um, and uh, I think also another important highlight is that it's supported by the global training uh, program and resources. We've collaborated to create 
a, a good training program for a lot of this stuff, which would, should help improve the capacity of the supply base and capability. All right. Okay, so talking about the reference manuals, um, there is a single AS 13100 standard that is, is encompasses everything that we're talking about here. And then and that then the reference manuals are available on the AESQ website. So you're you're going to be getting this if you haven't already in the handout section over here to the right. Um, you're going to be getting the links, and we're providing the links to the reference manuals. So all the all the important um, sections and guidance have been put together by cross-functional teams from the different OEMs, suppliers, member companies of AESQ, uh, as well as as other uh, industry experts to create these reference manuals. So our hope is that it really it really benefits the teams and helps explain the how. They're available for free and will be updated on a regular basis as we encounter new examples and, and, and think that it, uh, something could be beneficial to the supply base. Uh, we've created training programs. The goals of those training programs are to supp support the deployment and adoption of this new standard, um, the knowledge to design, maintain, and assess business processes to meet intent of the standard, and to focus on the key concepts. A little bit about the training that's available. Here's a link to the overview, but it's a it's an executive overview. It's free. Um, it's a, a five part video series, and many of us participated in that um, to help explain along the way what the thirteen thousand one hundred is, why we created it, and and what some of the benefits are of it. Then there's a details um, thirteen thousand one hundred requirements course. So this would be meant for um, the quality leader of your organization. That's meant to pull this together, flow it down, and execute on this transition within your site um, or your business. Uh, it's a 10 hour self-paced, really good detailed course, ensuring that all of the details of the AS 13100 are understood. And then there's a, a quality foundations course that is not yet ready, um, but it will be a three day classroom or virtual course, really focusing on quality. Uh, we think that's really, really important. Uh, GE does already do this today. Um, we do about six courses per year, um, three days in length, and uh, we found it very, very beneficial. <clears throat> and then I think one of the most important slides that we have in this deck, um, and so this is, it's a, how do we execute on the 13,100? It's a, it's a, a preparation or a milestone plan that you would be able to follow. Um, the 13,100 is is due to be completely incorporated at the end of next year. So December 31st, 2022 or January 1st, 2023 is when that this uh, new standard should be incorporated. Um, that seems like a lot of time, but it, it, it is only a lot of time if you start preparing now. So this is kind of a step-by-step -step guide to say, how are we gonna get from today to the end of next year and not, not have a rush um, within your supply, your, your, your business or ours, because there's things that internally we need to do to change as well as from an OEM perspective to make sure that we're ready. Um, we've had, we had a virtual supplier forum about a month ago. Um, we are here today to, to get the word out to as many folks as we can. Um, we're doing flow down uh, trainings and requirements with our supply base in terms of supplier broadcasts. Uh, we're doing training internally. And here are some just step-by-step -step guides to do some gap analysis with your current standards to the, the new standard, uh, start to develop some transition plans, and you'll be perfectly fine and all set by the end of next year. Yeah, Barbara, I just tag on to that. For those folks that are familiar with the NADCAP and with the uh, AS9100 certification, you know, when that rolled out, uh, folks developed a program plan of how you're going to execute from start to finish. And it was a 12 to 18 to 24 month journey, depending on the organization. And so I kind of equate this similar to that. You, you really takes a program plan to get from start to finish and make sure when you get to the end of next year, you're more than ready to be there. That's right. Uh, what GE has done specifically is we have already updated our S1000 to include um, the new AS13100. 
we have a part A and a part B, knowing that the suppliers are going to be in, in, in a various mix of deployment uh, over the next year and a half. And so we wanted to make sure it was in and, and the, the supply base could be aware of what the requirements will be. Uh, very, we're very much appreciative if they transition over early. Um, it could be any time between now and the end of next year, but you just have to follow our existing S1000 until that point in time. So there's going to be the ability to, to be in various stages of that transition over the next year and a half, but all is, all is, uh, is full of compliance. And I think we wanted to end with these, you know, handy links that allow you to get to the AESQ website, um, connect you to the standard, uh, some information on it. We have a zero defects video that that we think is great um, that you can use within your, you know, internal teams or your suppliers uh, to explain how it all connects together. Um, here's the executive overview training video that we highlighted earlier, as well as the reference manuals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the supply chain management handbook is a fantastic resource on the various uh, various topics that we always push people to um, if they ever have interest in any any of that. So from there, I think we would like to open it up to questions. Um, I see there's one question on the chat. Uh, do we have a date when the primes will release their updated quality business requirements? We certainly, as Barbara mentioned, we have already done that for GE. Uh, we have published S1000, and and I'll use this as an opportunity to, sh to share that, you know, we've gotten some feedback. Well, we're supposed to be standardizing and reducing, but yet S1000 went from 60 pages to, to roughly 100 pages. Well, that's because, as Barbara said, we split it into Part A, which was existing, and added a Part B, which is what will be there in January of 2023. So in essence, we've gone from approximately 70 pages to less than 40 once we are through the uh, implementation and deployment period. And I, I don't know, Becky, if you have line of sight to when the other OEMs are, are committing to, to be ready. The latest that I've heard is July 2021. We don't have specific target dates yet, but I would expect everyone to have everything float out this summer and updated. Mm -hmm. And we do have another question here from Tyler in the chat. He says, once fully transitioned, will suppliers be audited by their customers to ensure compliance? So yeah. the, way we, the way we plan on doing this for GE is, you know, as we said, we've got, we've got until the end of next year, we've already updated our S1000 checklist so that by the time we get to 2023, we will be auditing suppliers for conformity, new suppliers to, uh, to the requirements, including AS 13100. Uh, and in terms of uh, beyond that period, we, we are going to do some sampling, some sensing, if you will, uh, asking for evidence that the compliance uh, gap assessment has been accomplished and there's an annual requirement to assess your quality system. And so we'll be looking for evidence from that, probably uh, do some random uh, sampling and see how folks are doing. I think, I think what, what we've really looked at is communication is of the utmost important over always, really always, but over the next year and a half, it's, um, you know, we're partners, we're, we are partners throughout. And so your ability to transition, our ability to transition and make sure that we are the best we can be is, is you know, it behooves both of us. So communication on transition plans and if there's any questions is, is important to keep that line of communication open. Thank you. So we have a question from Allison asking, will certification to AS 13,100 be a requirement? At this time, there's no plans no. to adopt that. That's something that maybe the subject matter interest groups might take under advisement and, and try to to play on at some point, but right now that answer is no. Yeah, it's it's if, if we really need to think of it. So there's the AS9100 certification that we all understand um, and and get from from our own OEM standpoint. We've always you know required S1000 certification, and so have the other OEMs on their particular flow down. It's going to be exactly the same as what we currently require. Perfect. And then in relation to that, when audited by one customer against AS 13,100, will other customers recognize the outcome? Again, I think the same answer is at this time, that's that's a no. 
But again, I think one of the subject matter uh, interest groups for auditing is looking at that to see if there's any play. Okay. And then we're going to transition to a question on training. If you are trained in the current AS specs, uh, such as AS 13,000, 13,006, do you need further training? So I think the answer to that question is yes, it would depend on the content that was was provided in those AS standards and and how much of that carried through into the 13100. It, it might be a subset of that, but but I think at minimum, the answer has to be yes, because 13100 is a new document and we need to understand the, the width and breadth and depth of that. Yep, that's right. The 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 AS specs were were consolidated into that in addition to you know changes what, where we summarized the various OEM specific specs and then included things like human factors, um, AS9145, key actions. So that's all built into 13,102. So you may not need that, you know, you may already know in terms of the specs that you've been trained on and that would be helpful, but there is additional information that would be uh, beneficial to you from a training perspective. So does AS 13,100 take into consideration any of the regulatory requirements, FAA, CAA? Uh, yeah, when we developed in, in the writing team, we definitely had a list and, and, and visibility to, to those that each of the OEMs had from a, because you know what the FAA might require is different than what the ASA may require and what the Asia equivalent may require. So we, we had visibility of each of those and made sure that, that a standard is reflective of, of any and all of those uh, individual country and, and regional requirements. Great. And so with the reference manuals, do they uh, contain case studies or are they guides or what exactly are the reference manuals and how do they relate to the standard? That's a great question. Yeah. You know, as I said, these reference manuals, if you pull one up, there are some of them that are upwards of 160, 180 pages that includes detailed uh, case studies, practical examples. For instance, when we talk about a, a PFMEA, a process, uh, process failure mode and effects analysis, we have reference PFMEAs articulated in there, and we have examples for a machining. We have an example for a process. So we've gone to great lengths to try to be as prescriptive and, and, and try to be as practical as we could be based on the industry's needs. Yeah, I would say there's, there's a lot of love and care and pride that went into these reference manuals. So like I said, the specification is the what, but in terms of the how, everyone on these writing teams are part of the industry. You know, we're all part of GE or Pratt or Rolls or Safran, MTU, you know, GKN, Honeywell, IHI, et cetera, et cetera, that feel this and use this and work this every day. And so our goal in terms of making, making very practical examples, answering questions was, you know, felt throughout these reference manuals. So hopefully you'll find a lot of useful coming out of those reference manuals. Okay, so we have a question from Mark on the training. He says, could you please go over the training requirements and what format they take? How does one enroll in the training and is it mandatory? So maybe we could flip back to that slide um, yes. on the training right there. Okay, yes. So I'll just go quickly, video series. Um, and so this is available. This is also a virtual kind of self-paced um, 10 hour course. This is long, this is a longer one. And then the, the quality foundations course, which is not yet ready. So it's not ready for you to, to go ahead in um, and take yet is will be virtual or classroom, depending on, you know, the pandemic situation. I think we all agree that well, maybe we don't all agree, but we, we like classroom, um, but we have really found a lot of benefit in virtual over over the last year in, in order to, to maintain connectivity with our internal um, business partners and supply base. So the um, the 13,100 requirements course is, is really only mandatory for the quality leader. 
uh, of the organization so that they are able to um, truly understand the details in the course, uh, et cetera. And registration is open and available for that class. And I see where Angela has posted a link uh, in, in the chat. That's right. And so I think we have a link here for the executive overview. Um, and there's also a link on that final page that you'll be able to take a look at that has this as well.